I was trying to show the Starry Night painting, but it's too big. Well, we know images are 2D array of pixels. Let's try a simple trick. Remove all the even rows and even columns. This should give us a small image, exactly half the size of the original one. Let's try that. Nice. Now let's repeat the process and make it even smaller. Wait a second. What's happening? What's going on with these weird artifacts? These strange patterns weren't there in the original image. To answer this, we need to understand how sampling works. Imagine a smooth sine wave. It's a continuous function. But computers cannot store continuous signals. They work with discrete data. So we need to sample the signal. We do this by taking discrete samples, essentially picking points along the wave. It still looks like the original function. The samples capture the signal well. But that's a lot of samples. Can we use a fewer number of samples? This still looks OK. But as we reduce the number of samples even more, oh no, it turns into a straight line. The original signal is completely gone after sampling. And it doesn't even matter where I start the sampling. This is called an alias. I'm Peter, by the way. Doctor Strange. Oh, you're using your made up names. Um, I'm Spider-Man then. Let's go even further. Now when we look at our sample points, we may think the original wave was this orange curve instead. This is another alias. You may have seen other aliasing examples like this. So how many samples do we need to avoid this problem? Hmm. Well, a sine wave oscillates between positive and negative values. So intuitively, we need at least one sample for the positive lobe and one for the negative lobe. This means that we need at least two samples per period. But what if our signal isn't a simple sine wave? For example, this does not look like a sine wave. It turns out any signal can be broken down into a mix of sine waves with different frequencies. So to properly sample any signal, we only need to worry about the highest frequency component in it. Let's dive deeper into what happens when we sample a continuous signal. We start with this signal in the special domain. With the Fourier transform, we can represent the signal in the frequency domain. If a signal has a maximal frequency u max, we call it band limited. It has zero energy beyond that frequency. Now to digitize this signal, we multiply it with an impulse train, a series of periodic impulses. Adjusting the impulse train's spacing changes the sampling rate. But what does the Fourier transform of an impulse train look like? Interestingly, it's also an impulse train, but in the frequency domain. The spacing in the frequency domain is inversely related to the spacing in the spatial domain. This inverse relationship means that with denser sampling in the spatial domain, we have a larger spacing in the frequency domain. So what does it mean for our sample signal? We know that a sample signal is a multiplication between the original continuous signal and the impulse train. The convolution theorem tells us point-wise multiplication in the spatial domain is the same as convolution in the frequency domain. Therefore, sampling in the spatial domain results in copies of the original frequency spectrum shifted at regular intervals. We can extract the original signal perfectly by simply cropping out the center part. But if we reduce the sampling rate, the frequency copies move closer together. And if we sample too slowly, they start overlapping. This interference distorts the original signal beyond recognition. This is called aliasing. Let's take a closer look at a simpler example. Let's say here is our sample signal in the frequency domain. The maximum frequency of this band limit signal is u max. As we discussed earlier, we can perfectly reconstruct the original signal by cropping this part. The position of these rapid cars are the sampling frequency, that is, the number of samples taken from a continuous signal per second for temporal sampling or per unit length for spatial sampling. We can reduce the sampling frequency without getting into trouble 
as long as we sample at least twice the maximum frequency of the signal. But if we go below that, the overlapping copies cause distortion. This is known as the sampling theorem. We must sample at least twice the highest frequency in the signal to avoid aliasing. Now what if we need to reduce the sampling rate? For example, I need to shrink the painting to fit it into my slides. Since aliasing happens due to high frequency components, we can prevent it by applying a low pass filter, like a Gaussian filter, before sampling. This is called anti aliasing. By smoothing out the high frequency before downsampling, we get a more faithful representation of the original signal. But if we don't apply anti aliasing, the result is full of distortion. Now, what's this rectangle that lets us pick the correct frequencies? This is called a reconstruction filter. It helps us reconstruct a continuous signal from discrete samples. Or in other words, interpolate the missing values between the samples. But how do we actually implement this? From the convolution theorem, we know that multiplication in the frequency domain corresponds to convolution in the spatial domain. So what function in the spatial domain corresponds to a rectangle cutoff in the frequency domain? It's a function with a cool name, the sync function. By convolving the sync function with our samples, we can reconstruct the original continuous signals. But there are two drawbacks. The sync function extends infinitely, so computing it exactly is impractical. Second, sync filters create ripples near sharp transitions. These are called reading artifacts. How do we fix this? One solution is to multiply the sync function with the window function. A popular choice is the launch window, which gives us the launch resampling. Another approach is using a pubic kernel leading to bicubic interpolation, which along with launch is widely used for image resizing and interpolation. Let's get back to anti-aliasing. The same principles extend to 2D images. Before we subsample, we apply a low-pass filter, such as a Gaussian blur, to remove high-frequency contents. This prevents aliasing and ensures a smooth, accurate downsampled image. This highlights the importance of anti-aliasing. The process of a repeatedly blur and downsampled an image allow us to construct a sequence of images with varying spatial resolution. This is called a Gaussian pyramid. Using the Fourier transform, we can visualize how the frequency content changes at different levels. As we go to lower resolutions, the image frequencies shift toward lower values. This technique is useful for scale space analysis, feature extractions, object detections, and coarse to fine estimation. And that's how sampling, aliasing, and anti-aliasing work. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.